Welcome to Quality Improvement, HIT's Impact on a Patient Safety Culture. This is Lecture B. The objective for this lecture is to identify strategies for adaptive work that can be useful to HIT initiatives. The last phase of my talk because I think it's the most important and that is, yeah, all this technical stuff is great, Peter, but why do quality improvement efforts fail? And I said 90% of them fail. They don't achieve their goals. For the most part, I mean, some do fail because we don't have measurement, and that's a piece of it. But most fail because we don't get by, and they fail of what we call the adaptive piece. Because all these projects have a technical component. That's kind of the science, right? What's the evidence? What the measure is? But they fail for what I call the adaptive that is, things that require changes in people's values and attitudes and beliefs. Right? The, the nurse feeling comfortable questioning the docs. No one debated the evidence. The technical piece was fine. It was the culture piece. So I want to leave you with some tips for adaptive change. And, and they're mostly metaphors, so they're all metaphors, but they're really powerful. The first idea for adaptive change is to be unwavering in the hill you're going to climb but invite everybody to help you climb it. Let me give you an example. When I was about 18, I went on a camping trip. And we were a number of mountains we can climb. And they broke us into three groups of boys. And each had a counselor. The and we were sitting by the campfire the night before. It was a chilly night. And the counselors were discussing what we're going to do the next day, what hill we're going to climb. The first counselor comes up to his group and said, you see that hill there? That's what we're going to climb and then gave the boys an hour lecture on how they're going to do it, and everyone fell asleep. No passion. Right. Second counselor came up, I, I think he may have been high, and said, you know, I, I'm not sure what hill we're going to climb. You guys could decide. There's a lot of beautiful hills. Equally, no passion. Right. The third counselor came up, the group I was in, and said, you see that hill over there? That's the Cirque of Towers. Now, I'm not sure we can get there. It's going to be hard. But if we get there, boy, does it have a beautiful view. It, you know, we're going to have to collaborate like we haven't before. We're going to have to pull together to do it. But I think if we do, we can make it, right? And that guy had a red, bunch of revved up boys ready to work. And I see all the time these leadership failures where we either micromanage how you're going to do it, right? And we don't tap that wisdom. Or the opposite, we're lazy, fair, and you do whatever you want. And again, there's no direction, right? So getting... Un we will eliminate catheter-related infections, right? There was no waiver. I didn't want to hear any whining about it. But I was home enough to say, yeah, but I need your help to do it. I don't know how to do it. Please join in the group. Balance is key. The second is make sure there's no monsters in the bathroom. No monsters in the bathroom. So let me tell you the story. When my son was in third grade, he came home from school and said, Daddy, 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 there's monsters in the bathroom. I said, oh, yeah, okay, Ethan, great. Next day, he comes back, clearly distressed. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy there's monsters in the bathroom. I'm afraid to go in there. So obviously, I was concerned. I called the school and said, hey, help me understand what's up. Ethan's afraid to go in the bathroom. And the teacher chuckled and said, uh oh, we put in automatic flush toilets, and nobody told the kids. <laughs> right? And think about the way you roll out quality programs, right? Or we roll out information systems, right? We don't have the greatest, what I call, containing vessels to communicate with the staff about what the reason why we're doing it, and they see it as monsters in the bathroom. So make sure that there are what I call containing vessels to communicate with your staff about why this is going on, because if you don't, you will get resistance. The third key principle is surface the real and perceived loss. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you think that clinicians, and doctors in particular, resist change? Most people resist change. Let me ask you to think about this a little bit deeper, perhaps a little bit differently. If we were to give most of you, or most of our faculty, a winning lottery ticket for $100 million, unless you're independently wealthy, almost all of us who are staff, well, it would change our lives pretty dramatically. And I doubt if any of you or them would say, Oh, no, Peter, you keep your $100 million. I hate change. Change isn't good. I don't want $100 million. Now, that would never happen. Why? 
Because we don't fear change, we fear loss, and loss has a real component. It may take things longer, and it's perceived that you don't communicate effectively. So, without tackling those monsters in the bathroom, when we first started doing this, nurses questioning doctors in the whole state of Michigan and every hospital, it was, they're revolting, they're taking over doctors' roles. It was like Animal Farm. It was nothing like this, but the case was that, in many cases, we didn't communicate the message well and the perceived loss. In the decision-making sciences, people may ask, how do you make the right decision? What's the strategy for making right decisions? The right decision is the one that the team supports, the one that they agree to implement. Forget which one is right or wrong. There's often no right or wrong effort. It's the one that the collective group agrees that they're going to implement. Because if you don't have that, it won't work. So surface the real and perceived um, loss. The next idea for this adaptive change is value the dissenter. Value the dissenter. So let me frame this for you because most of us in quality have got the concept that individual people aren't to blame, that it's a system problem. Although I think, quite frankly, our nursing boards may still need to get that message a little, and pharmacy boards may need to get that message a little, a little clearer. But when things go wrong, we generally, maybe we went too far on the systems. But once you take a one step back from that sharp end, from where the mistake occurred to the group, we are right back in tribal warfare. Right? And if you don't believe that, I happen to have the advantage of wearing multiple hats, so I sit in different things. So I sit in nursing break rooms and hear, well, if only the administration would do this, right? If only the doctors would do that. Or I sit in your executive discussions, right? And discussions, well, if staff or nurses or docs weren't so lazy or whatever the issue is, right? We fall right back into the judging people's intentions. And it's really destructive. And what I found perhaps the most liberating and powerful approach to this adaptive change is I assume everyone is in healthcare because they want to do what's right for patients. And I don't think that's Pollyannish. I, th I really believe it's, it, it's true. And therefore, if there's resistance to, some, or to some, something happening, there's likely wisdom in that. And my job is not to bully that resistance, but it's to understand it and find out why the resistance is. Because there's often either a misperception or a kernel of truth in that, right? And we don't necessarily approach that well. So when I have someone resisting, my our usual approach is to simply listen, something we're often not good at as managers, and go in and say, you know, I see you're not supporting this, and acknowledge their commitment to their patients. And I know you're committed to giving high-quality care for your patients. I have no doubt that you want what's best for your patients. But I see you're not supporting this. Help me understand why. Right? And then I just listen. And often I find there's some unintended risks for this stuff that I hadn't think of. And they're, they're right, but the way they expressed it was the whole thing was shot because of this risk. And I said, okay, you know, let's, how do we then manage that particular risk you're having? Um, and it's a very, very powerful way. But we often fall too quickly into assuming other people's bad intentions, or at least what I will call the tribe's intentions, right? It, it, whether it's one unit versus another or the the docs versus nurses versus administration. We don't necessarily uh, say, hey, if you're resisting something, I'm va validating that you want what's absolutely best for your patients. But again, I'm not waving on the hill we're going to climb. We're going to eliminate infections, right? So I, yeah, I understand your resistance. But what we need to do is find out what that barrier is. It doesn't mean that I'm going to give on what the ultimate goal is. Right? You may not like it, but we're, we're going to reduce infections. So that balance is key. Now, I hope those five or those principles of adaptive work resonate with you because as you do this work, what you will see is things don't fail mostly for the technical work. They fall for this adaptive piece. And none of us are trained in this adaptive work, and it's really where the culture change lies. can't tell you how many hospitals I've worked with where they want to implement the daily goals, and a well-intentioned nurse manager will say, Peter, I copied the Hopkins Daily Goals, handed it out to all my staff, and told them, you will do this. And she said, but it didn't really go well. I said, well, do you think? <laughs> I mean, of course it didn't go well, right? You didn't get any buy-in. They don't understand why. They didn't make it theirs. Apply some of these principles, and you're likely going to get much more buy-in, which is why all this work has to be owned locally and, uh, and, and, and by our teams. 
you can tell I, I have a passion on this. And, you know, and perhaps my passion is rooted, like some of yours might be, in my personal uh, relationships. My father, some of you may know, or some of you who read the book, died of a diagnostic error. Uh, they thought he had one kind of cancer and he had another. Actually, his second opinion was when I was a Hopkins medical student and Hopkins diagnosed him correctly. Perhaps this explains my love of Hopkins, I think. But he then came home to die in hospice, and then he had the most horrible hospice experience. I mean, he writhed in pain for a week, and uh, he suffered needlessly. And when I questioned the pain, I was told, well, that's all the pain medicine we can give him, you know, which I obviously know now, and it's just a myth. It was just poor quality care. And luckily, hospice care is dramatically better. But I remember so deeply as he's dying and sitting beside his bed, um, you know, I hadn't been super close to my dad uh, for because for, he was working a lot or I was working growing up. And as he was kind of sitting there delirious, I regretted about how much I missed having that time to, to do the adaptive work or to, to, to get to know him uh, better as a person and, and uh, understand him better. But this medical error stuff, kind of took that away needlessly short. Uh, and all of us and all of our patients we treat have those same stories. They have grandkids they want to see. They have weddings they want to go to. And we have far too many people dying needlessly. And I hope through this work that you give your patients that opportunity uh, to connect better with their loved ones and live uh, fuller lives. So I thank you. This concludes Lecture B of HIT's impact on a patient safety culture. In summary, there are five principles that will help IT professionals to support the adaptive work in which clinicians engage when transitioning to new information technology. These include being focused on the goal and involving all stakeholders in decisions, ensuring that there are no unseen, quote, monsters, unquote, in the bathroom bringing the real and perceived losses to the surface, valuing dissenting opinions, and assuming that all healthcare providers want to do what is right for the patient.